Everyone, welcome to God's Plan, Your Part, Year 2, where this year we're reading through and studying the entire New Testament, one chapter at a time. Thanks again for joining us in discovering God's plan and your part in it. Today we are looking at Acts chapter 9, and this is probably one of the big pivot points in the book of Acts. This is where Paul is going to go from persecuting the church to trying to lead the church, uh, which seems like a pretty big change. Uh, And for the most part, it happens just right here in Acts chapter 9, and things are going to shift and change and move and grow very quickly after this chapter. So Ryan brought up the idea of Paul, well, I should say Saul, essentially just like completely changing his perspective on everything by the grace of God um, and becomes who we would know more so as Paul. What I think is really interesting about this is oftentimes when you think or hear of any kind of like serious, serious life change, oftentimes you would anticipate or expect something would have been like, I don't know, gradually changing to lead them to that point. Like it's not, it's Mm. typically not like this cold turkey moment. So I think leading up to this moment, well, I guess not necessarily leading up to after this moment where Saul has apparently like completely changed all of his ways, I would be very skeptical because you would anticipate if somebody has such a heart change that there would be like this drastic, oh, well, I guess like over time, drastic change to this new understanding or new perspective. And that doesn't seem evident, but there is something that you were pointing out about like the timeline of this and how it all played out. Because to me, if I would have been one of those early believers, I would have been like, heck no, this guy was just killing Stephen yesterday. There's no way that I'm just like on board with this. But, and many people, many people were like that. Like it, it was, it would not be uh, unwise um, to say like, hey, that seems sudden and <laughs> you seem dangerous and I don't want you in my house. And that, that actually is covered in this, uh, in this chapter is later in this chapter. Uh, but the, the early Christians do not want Saul right. to be around. They don't want to spend time with him. They think he's dangerous. And mm-hmm. it is Barnabas. This is a huge deal. It is Barnabas, the guy who we saw selling the field earlier on, uh, that says, hey, uh, he can come with me. Like, And he vouches for him. He says, hey, he saw Jesus in a vision. This man prayed for him. He was healed. He is a believer. And Barnabas uses, leverages his reputation uh, to kind of call up Paul. And he becomes a mentor of Paul. And they minister together for quite a while. Uh, I mean, you you really can't teach the story of Paul without Barnabas. But I think something to be noted is that the fear is very real. But there is a piece, like you were talking about yes. before we even started the episode, there is like a timeline piece that does need to be mentioned because that changed my perspective immediately as well. Like this wasn't necessarily a cold turkey thing. Um, there was still skepticism, which I probably still would have been in that boat anyway after hearing about this major change. But there was a lot of time that passed Yes, that you were mentioning earlier. It is really, really important that everybody hear me on this because this story is commonly misunderstood because you cannot read Acts 9 and understand Acts 9 without reading Galatians 1 and understanding Galatians 1. So if you are an avid listener of the podcast, please make sure you read Galatians 1 today uh, on your own. It's not going to be included. The audio of that won't be included until we get to Galatians later on. But Paul kind of gives this account of this conversion in Galatians. And in Galatians, he's a little bit clearer with the timeline. Um, if you look in Galatians 1, 17, again, I'm telling you, read the whole chapter. Uh, it's not very long, by the way. Um, he says, he's kind of recounting his call by God. I'll start in um, verse 15. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, that's Peter, and remained with him 15 days. So there is a three-year period that occurs somewhere in this Acts 9 area. And some people try to place it different places. Um, But the, the important thing here is that 
a lot of times we understand Paul's conversion as like immediate, like he is persecuting Christians on Monday. Um, Jesus speaks to him in a vision. He's blind. Ananias prays for him. And on Tuesday, he is leading Gentiles to Jesus. Well, if you read the text for like how it is, I mean, things progress pretty quickly, which I mean, thank God they do, because I don't really like to read a whole (laughs) lot. And so if I'd been reading each event, you know, play by play, I'd probably lose interest pretty quickly. However, if you read it for face value, that can be easily missed. I think that's definitely happened to me in the past. And without knowing that detail, that changes things a lot. Like that actually gives, I believe you told me too, like we had talked about Paul in the past and he had like spends significant times with the Holy or with Jesus, like learning from him that he later talked, doesn't he, he later talks well, about that in other letters. It's, it's that three years in Arabia. People look right. at that three years in Arabia and they're like, Hey, what is that? What's going on there? Um, there are traditions that teach that for three years, he was actually like in Arabia with a vision of Jesus or with Jesus himself being taught by Jesus himself. And he, he alludes to that in other books. He talks about, like he refers to himself as an apostle. Mm-hmm. Apostles were the guys that spent literal time with, with Jesus. Jesus yeah. um, and he, he does call himself the least of the apostles, but he, he doesn't shy away from that title. And that title was given to the leaders of the early church who had spent time with Jesus. Now, what's mm-hmm. interesting about this is when you understand that there was time spent, it actually helps you appreciate preparation. A lot of times this story yeah. is used to like uh devalue preparation. Like, well, you know, Paul like one day is persecuting the church, the next day he's an apostle. It's like, well, actually, that's not true. Um and he had a lot of time to prepare. Well, First of all, think about any missionaries that you know or even Jesus mission like ministry himself. Like he spent time like Jesus, God himself spent time to like prepare himself for yes. ministry against temptations. If I think about ministry or missionaries that we know, oftentimes when they go out to like be in the field, they spend significant like 10 months at a time preparing themselves for the ministry they're about and, to be in. I can't imagine that Saul just turned Paul would be any different. Well, he is in a unique situation because he studied under Gamaliel, uh, who was a very wise Jewish teacher. And Paul would have had a really strong background for all the things that we're teaching about Jesus. He just had to like put on these lenses that were like, oh yeah, that's about Jesus. So like everything he would have learned would have still been very valuable to him. It's just that he now understood that it was all about Jesus. So he had a lot of really strong background, um, but he also, you know, took time to prepare. And that is obvious in Galatians 1, 17 and 18. Uh, the way that this has done a lot of damage to us is one, a lot of people pursue Christian leadership when they have not been adequately prepared and they make a ton of mistakes. They teach a lot of things that aren't true and they conduct themselves poorly because they think that they can just be like a Saul turned Paul and one day be an atheist and the next day be a Christian and now they should have authority. That's not helpful. That's not healthy. Um, We as Christians should be more wise and more discerning and we should be willing to say, hey, I love that you are now following Jesus. I think I would like to help you understand what it means to follow Jesus before I give you a platform. Mm. Um, I can think of many situations in the recent past uh, where people who were pretty staunchly not Christians, um, they claimed that they had become Christians and it turned out that was not authentic. And that was incredibly damaging uh, to the reputation of Christians and to the you know platforms where they are. Like I, I can remember, what was it like the... Was it a summer where Kanye was suddenly a Christian and he was preaching like <laughs> I was every... waiting for you to say his name like oh, I well I mean listen there. like the guy the guy put out an album that was called Jesus is King um, our church at the time put out stickers that said Jesus is King um, <laughs> I, they would never have admitted it was because of Kanye but it definitely was uh, we were doing devotions at school once and somebody like, based on Kanye his album. yeah uh, and like he was preaching in a lot of really big churches he's not a Christian. Like he, he is not obedient to the teachings of Christ and it is evident from his life today. So anybody that allowed him to be on their stage and use their platform, like that was a foolish decision and it would have been okay um, to encourage wisdom and discernment and preparation. So I, I guess that's the end of my rant about Saul turned Paul. Um, just be careful. And it's not, it's not, <laughs> 
wrong to say like, hey, take some time and learn, like go to school. You don't have to go to school um, to be a pastor, to be a Christian leader. It's not required, but it actually is super helpful. Not only that too, it's also to, like helpful to have like sound, I would say sound mentors. Yes. Specifically in like understanding the Bible. Um, I don't know. I feel like I mean, we went to Bible school. I think you certainly took a lot more with you if, than I did. If, but if I would say that like learning the Bible was like an easy task, I would say that's probably not the case. But having someone walking alongside of you that knows the text and has taken lots yes, of time to study yes. and like understand background, that's really helpful. There are too. much cheaper much smarter and affordable ways to do preparation than going to Bible college. Like if I could have gotten, and I, and I like, that is why I do a lot of what I do today. I want to create ways for people to get what I had to pay for, for free. Like we should, as a church, as a body of believers, be able to equip each other. Uh, and it shouldn't cost $80,000. That's silly. Um, but just please Sounds like cheap. <laughs> yeah. Just please don't devalue preparation. It's really good and it's really necessary. I mean, so much so, again, that Jesus was doing it himself. Especially as people know less and less about what the Bible says, as people know less and less what it means to be disciplined. Like, we need preparation. And particularly if you want to be an influential Christian leader, you need preparation. So, all that to say, don't understand Paul's story incorrectly. A hundred percent, he has this radical life change. Uh, it was not between Monday and Tuesday. Mm -hmm. It covered a couple of years. Well, and there were, again, like if you continue on throughout the chapter, there's a lot of people that are second guessing him, whether it's the people that are hearing him for the first time that would have been like on his side. They're starting to be like, wait a minute, what was he saying? Yes. And on top of that, you also have the Christians who are like, what? What did he say? <laughs> because they're, I would assume the whole time I'm thinking like, I would think this guy's like some weird undercover cop that's going right. to like turn me in to whoever. So being Saul turned Paul, although awesome, seems like it has some pretty like awful scenarios that have to play out. I mean, he has to get taken out of the city in a basket because people are watching the gates, making sure that he's not leaving because they want to turn him over and be like, hey you change sides and these are these are most likely people he would have known right so yeah. like the chapter starts out with him seeking like a like an official document that allows him to imprison people for for following christ and halfway through the chapter now those people that would have given him that official document are like oh we need to arrest him and try to kill him <laughs> get that document back <laughs> yeah exactly yeah um, and so anyway there's some other things that happen too it's not just strictly about uh saul However, um, things to be noted, like the work of the Lord is still happening, regardless of people trying to take care of Saul, uh, regardless of the yeah. fact that they may still be even be like fearful of who Saul is. Um, so there's actually like people still being, I mean, Dorcas restored to life. Um, who was the other one that you said earlier? Aeneas. Aeneas. But, I mean, literally he's healed, being he's able healed. to walk. Yeah. So like there's still no shortage of like the fact that God is working in other ways outside of Saul's life as well. So the church is still growing. People are still coming to know who Jesus is. Um, all the while, it seems just like, it's just like whack-a-mole for all the, the people in charge. Like, we got to get this under control because this is getting crazy. More and more, there's no way they're going to keep this under control. Mm -hmm. It is growing. It is spreading. We're covering vast areas and seems many exhausting. cities. It's not exhausting. It's exciting. Like No, it's no. I mean, for try, them, trying like to stop trying it. to stop what God is doing is like, oh, that well, must have been horrible. <laughs> again, like what a foolish thing to even yeah. think you can do that. Like, oh, I think God's doing this. We better stop it. <laughs> it's like you already put people in prison. They weren't in yeah. prison anymore. You already killed somebody and they came back to life anyway. Like, stop it. Like, you're clearly losing mm -hmm. this battle and you should be obedient to what God's called you to be obedient to. So I think overall, like your part would be this chapter is just like full of evidences of what God is still doing in the church, regardless of like the bumps that are happening along the way. And I think your part is to seriously, like think about your own life today or maybe within like the last week, like how has God actually still been at work? Maybe it might not be like healing somebody. Maybe it is healing somebody. It could be. Who knows? It could be. Um, and maybe it's like a serious life change that you have seen someone through, but like, think about the ways that you have seen God at work because his work doesn't just stop here in acts. Like it's continuing on throughout the church today for those who are, um, fully seeking him and 
completely abandoning their life to his will. I would add a little piece of that. Then just because of this whole conversation about preparation, the next time you hear an incredible story of somebody near you, like somebody you actually know or somebody you're related to or something, the next time you hear a story of like a radical change, like they actually gave their life to Christ, like offer to help walk with them and yeah. mentor them. Like, yes, it's exciting. Yes, we want to encourage them. Maybe you could be part of their preparation. Maybe you could help them learn what it means to be mature and walk in faith. We all need that. We all need that. So I just want to continue to to talk about the um, importance of preparing and studying to show thyself approved. Paul's going to write that later on. Um, so <laughs> I, the King James I think it's version? a good thing. Yeah, it is actually. <laughs> what tipped you off? Uh, we'll, we'll be back again tomorrow with Acts chapter 10. We'll see you then. Thanks for joining today's episode of God's Plan, Your Part. As always, please consider partnering with us as we are a listener-supported podcast that we hope to continue to grow with support from listeners just like you. We've made it super easy to partner with us, and you can support us by following the link in our show notes or our description. You can support us with as little as $3 a month. Every little bit of this helps so much, and we're so thankful for your support. With that in mind, here's today's reading. Acts chapter 9. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise, and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus, named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias, come in and lay hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon the name? And has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among those at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarshish. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. 
Now as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who were at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose. And all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please, come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of God's Plan, Your Part. Don't forget, you can find us on just about every social media platform and YouTube. Let us know what you thought of today's episode, and if you have any questions, go ahead and post them there. You can also reach out to us directly at godsplanyourpart at gmail.com. As always, if you don't have a Bible, or if you'd like to use the one that we use, uh, reach out to us via email, and we'll be happy to send one to you. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you again tomorrow.